uh, but I haven't been dumping the links for them uh, on Canvas because that got to be just a long list of a bunch of announcements saying here's another link and it bothered me. It was annoying and ugly. And so I'm not putting the links, but if you just go onto YouTube and search around and hunt around, you should be able to find those no problem. Uh, they should all be grouped under my name. Um, I'm not telling you you need to subscribe to my channel because I don't care about it. it. Doesn't like I don't get. If you want to, you can. It's not going to make me happy or sad if you don't. But it will make me sad if I just keep making announcement after announcement after announcement on our Canvas homepage with another link because it was ugly and it was bothering me. All right. So as we finish up chapter 29, we need to finish. We need to come back to where we left off on Friday, and we left off with this question of what does it mean to be human. And I left you with a statement that said, uh, I, I want to encourage you that one thing you should not include in, in your description of what it means to be human is that you are a member of species Homo sapiens. Because there are, are a lot of data to suggest that being human is, is more broad than that. And we're going to continue this discussion today. But as we do, we need to put some other organisms uh, into context. So traditionally, uh, the non-human apes, so apes that aren't considered to be hominids, uh, even by uh, evolutionary thinking, uh, were grouped into a separate family. We're grouped into family Pongidae. So you had, uh, as far as your living apes, you had gorillas, you had chimpanzees, you had bonobos, you had orangutans. Sometimes gibbons would be in there depending on a person's classification scheme. Uh, and then all of your humans, all of your hominids would be in hominidae. The problem is, if you want all of your taxa to represent evolutionary trajectory, which is the way a lot of taxonomists, we call them systematists, uh, are nowadays, they don't want taxa that don't mean anything as far as the evolutionary progression of a lineage. Okay, And this is why reptiles, we talked about this last week, is really confusing because it's like, okay, I, I, I picture something when you say reptile, but then it's a little bit confusing. What do you mean? Are you also including birds with that? Are you including the, you know, your original amniote in that description? I mean, what are we dealing with? And again, the same kind of issue that it's a taxon that doesn't necessarily clearly represent the evolutionary trajectory if all these organisms did root back to a single ancestor. And so because of that, um, yeah, basically the idea is the, the, the ancestor that we would share with chimpanzees, if that ancestor existed, would be in Pongidae, but we are in a separate family. And that's unfortunate. They, we, they, you, you don't like that kind of grouping if you are a systematist, okay? You want... Uh, all of the descendants of a particular ancestor to be in the same taxon. And so basically what that's done is it's forced moving gorillas, chimpanzees, and bonobos uh, into our family, into hominidae. And then so your other great apes, orangutans and sometimes gibbons, depending on classification scheme, are still in Pongidae. That family still exists. And the ancestor there would be kind of outside of that family altogether. It wouldn't be in Pongidae or in Hominidae. So now you've got something that's okay, um, would be in a bigger group. And so this is kind of how we, we operate currently with the classification of, of great apes uh, and humans. All right, so that's kind of the idea, it, it, the evolutionary idea or trajectory of, of where humans come from is basically we, our most recent common ancestor would be between us and either bonobos or chimpanzees. And now all of those, that ancestor and the descendants are all inside of family hominidae. Yeah. Um, wasn't, I was just looking and it just argued. Um, doesn't the fact that they're changing like the taxon families and what tribe they're in, what, doesn't that kind of like work to just no, because it's just a different philosophy be behind how you name. And so traditional taxonomy is based entirely on shared characteristics and doesn't focus really at all on evolutionary trajectory. Like sometimes you just luck out and those shared characteristics happen to overlap with evolutionary trajectory, but it doesn't always happen. So it's a change in philosophy, which would require a change in, in names and moving organisms into different... Uh, taxa. But we will talk about some issues that do provide some evidence against rooting humans and all of the great apes back to a single ancestor. First of all, one that comes up often 
uh, as we're talking about these issues, is the phylogeny of just our family, hominidae, uh, contains several polytomies. Okay, so the phylogeny of just uh, our family uh, contains several uh, polytomies. So that is when you include the great apes or many of the great apes in with humans, we have a lot of issues in that phylogeny. There, and the textbook even talks about this. It's very difficult to even figure out what the you know the direct ancestor of humans would be like, right? And some of those characteristics, and a lot of that is because of these uh, polytomies. So even just within our genus. Uh, homo, you have several polytomies just there. And there, we'll talk about this, this in a little bit. These polytomies are for a different reason. It's not necessarily because of evidence of discontinuity. It's more a result of just not having very many uh, specimens for some of the species in our genus. Some of the species in our genus are known only from a single specimen. Well, that's tough if you want to try to figure out how these things group together. Um, yeah, so here's some evidences that we also need to consider uh, when, we're, when we're talking about trying to figure all this out. We find uh, archaeological sites that actually have multiple species of our genus uh, in the same place. Uh, probably the best example of this is a site called uh, Demonisi. And so here you find very clear uh, Homo erectus, uh, individuals, somewhat clear Homo neanderthalensis individuals, and then less clear some other species. But we have multiple species of our genus living in the same place at the same time in the same society that are all fossilized together. Well, that's interesting. Now it's starting to look like these species interacted uh, a, a great deal. Add to this our genome, so uh, our species on average and it, and it varies with where your, your descent comes from. But on average, an individual of our species, 7% of our genome, 7% of our genes, actually are Neanderthal genes. And so we have enough DNA from Neanderthals to actually make these comparisons. And so it's strong evidence that our species and Homo neanderthalensis interacted and actually had children together. Now, this is uh, even, even more, I think, intriguing. So Todd, Todd Wood, Dr. Todd Wood, and our own Dr. Francis have published several papers and a couple of book chapters uh, on this, basically showing that there is, there is very obvious discontinuity between our genus and other members of family hominidae. Um, and so what you get from this is that an argument for why are there polytomies in the entire family Pongidae? And it's probably because we do not share an ancestor with chimpanzees, with bonobos, with gorillas, which is nice that you find that discontinuity. That's what you would expect if what scripture teaches about origins, that man was a separate, special, unique creation and does not seem to, in scripture, share physical ancestry with the rest of creation, and, and you find this. You find evidence of this discontinuity. So we have an explanation for why are there phylogenies when you do the whole family, because you're trying to characterize an ancestor and ancestors that never existed. But I think because of the lack of discontinuity between members of our genus, I don't think you can make that same argument about the polytomies there. I think the polytomies within our genus, the only way to explain them is we just don't have enough specimens for some of the other members of our genus. And maybe including this species, which is in another genus. Although, I will tell you, some people argue that this should be Homo sediba and not Australopithecus sediba, which would make it to where none of the oh, organisms that tend to cluster with our species are outside of our genus. Yeah, Jake. Um, what are some, or from the science side, what are some examples of those discontinuities? And I'll give that to you right now. So we've got several genera, we've got Paranthropus, uh, we've got a number of species within Australopithecus. Uh, there are some other genera, but we don't have as many specimens from them. But a number, so Lucy uh, is, uh, you all, you're all familiar with Lucy? Um, Lucy is Australopithecus afarensis. Um, and so, and then you have Paranthropus, several species in there. And what you find is you find obvious discontinuity between all the members of our genus and most of the species in those genera. 
with the exception of Australopithecus sediba, which again, some people argue ought to be Homo sediba. And so you don't find that same discontinuity between or among the members of our genus. And then you have evidence that our species has interbred with other species within our genus. Yeah. In the, in the fossil record and yep. stuff like that for uh, like Australopithecus or mm -hmm. uh, Homo and whatnot, how many of those fossils that they've had are actually like separate species? Do you think, or like? How oh, that's know? yeah. So you can have a discussion of what what how do we define a species, yeah. right? So basically, what this what this basically uh, forces you to do is to say, okay, we don't really have good evidence against all of the species of our genus rooting back to a single ancestor. Mm -hmm. We do, however, have really good evidence that our genus does not root back to an ancestor with any other genus in family hominidae. Okay. Okay, so then what you'd have to say is, you'd have to say what I said on Friday, that you probably ought not to say that in order to be human, you have to be homo sapiens. You probably should not make that statement because there's not really good evidence to suggest that all the species of our genus don't root back to a okay. single ancestor. I mean, we do have some polytomies, mm -hmm. but I think the best explanation for that is we just don't have enough yeah. specimens for some of those mm -hmm. species. But as far as like Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis, where we've got a lot of specimens, there's there's not that complicated polytomy. You can figure things out a lot more okay. easily. Um, so I, that's one suggestion I would make. Now, if you want to get into the discussion of should we classify them as separate species, that's mm -hmm. another discussion altogether. Okay. And uh -huh. so you can't do it based on the biological species concept, except for Neanderthals, because uh -huh. if, if we have evidence that we interbred with Neanderthals, then by the biological species concept, we should not be separate species, right? Yeah. By the biological species concept, we should be a single mm -hmm. species. But if you're using multiple species concepts, there are some, some morphological features where you're like, okay, this is obviously Neanderthal, this is obviously Homo sapiens, yeah. and so you can still make those classifications. However, you could also do that with somebody's skull that's from European descent versus uh -huh. somebody's skull that's from Asian descent versus somebody's skull that's from African descent. You could do that same thing mm -hmm. where you're like, okay, well, here are some characteristics where I can tell where your yeah. ancestry is from. Okay. And so then there's a question of, okay, well, what, what are meaningful differences? Mm -hmm. Is the fact that you don't have a brow ridge and Neanderthals do, is that a meaningful difference? Mm -hmm. Is the fact that they don't have as strong a chin as you have mm -hmm. and they're you know, brain case is a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, different size than ours. Is that enough evidence? So, I mean, you can play that game, mm -hmm. but I think it's just simpler to say, just to make a statement of you probably ought not to suggest that in order to be human, you have to be homo sapiens. Yeah. Because it looks like the human kind is more varied than that. And so within like uh, Australopithecus uh -huh. and stuff like that, when, um, when geologists, or not geologists, archaeologists go out and they find yep. like a new fossil or something like that, how do they know that it would then be maybe a different species of Australopithecus and not just maybe a fossil? You have to do it based on structural features. Oh, okay. Yeah, if, if they, and so basically it's done if they have more different structural features than they do mm -hmm. similar, or again, based on the philosophy we discussed last week, mm -hmm. whatever requires the fewest number of evolutionary changes, okay. that's basically how we consider the evolutionary progression happened. Okay. Um, so you'd have to do it based on, on structural. Did you have something, Charles? Uh, yeah, how would you explain the different brain size and pair of genus? I mean, you could see you still have, I mean, they're not that different, but you still have differences in brain sizes within our species. And so the variation in brain sizes that you have among species is not significantly greater than the variation in brain size that we have within our own species. It is different. But, it, and again, it's kind of, we have a lot more specimens of our species than we do of any other, you know, of any other member of our family. So then there's the question of, well, if we had more specimens, would those differences still hold true? It would be, or would it look more like a continuum? So what we do have, though, does it indicate any more advancements? In yeah, it's, it's, like yeah. So there, there is some indication that there's a relationship between brain size and intelligence, but it's not quite as clean as you might expect. It's not quite as clean as you might expect. It's not like this really simple linear model where like your brain gets bigger, you're more intelligent. Mm -hmm. But there are a number of other ways you can explain a number of these features. Um, some very strange things can happen, especially with regards to size and shape of specific structures. Uh, when you have a small gene pool. And we're actually going to talk about this a lot today. 
Uh, we'll begin this discussion today. We'll finish it on Wednesday, these mechanisms of evolutionary change. And when you have a small gene pool, which you can very easily get regardless of what species of hominid you're talking about, you can get some really interesting changes in shape and size of particular structures that are already in place very easily. And you can see this, yeah, I mean, in, in, in groups of our own species where you get some really unique genetic abnormalities coming in in really high occurrence because of the small gene pool. Yeah. I mean, is it the same thing, like, is in, like, the average, like, human height, like, you get taller now than it was? Oh, sure. So, like, there's not, there's not a, I mean, like, and obviously it's not a different species, so, like, is this, could it be addressed in the That one's a little bit that? more cleanly of a continuum than skull size. Okay. So that one's a little bit cleaner, you know, I mean, we've got, I mean, height is very obvious. You've got this nice bell-shaped curve even of living humans, of living individuals of our species. And when you start bringing in, like, you know, fossil, I mean, that one's a little bit cleaner than, okay. than skull size. I, I mean, it is very easy. If, if you were, I mean, I could probably in five minutes teach you enough that you could look at a skull and tell with pretty good certainty which species of our genus it belongs to. Within five minutes, I could probably help you to do that. We're not going to do that because I don't want to. Um, but you could probably do that, and that's interesting. And then so you have to come up with, okay, well, why do we have these structural differences? And we're going to talk about mechanisms of evolutionary change today, and we'll kind of bring this back. Okay, so basically what I'm getting at is, is this, and this is the take-home message. Um, the humankind is, I think, very clearly and very obviously distinct from other forms of creation. That there's a humankind that when you study it, no matter when new fossil, new specimens come up, every time you still get this very clear discontinuity between our genus and maybe Australopithecus sediba, which you might notice is not on this chart. Okay, Australopithecus sediba and might actually be better to think of as, as part of uh, our genus. Um, But yeah, there's very clear, so whenever you find a new specimen, you still get this clear discontinuity between humans and non-humans. Okay? So I would say we have good evidence to suggest that the humankind is separate from all other creation. However, I think there's good evidence to suggest that the humankind is a lot more varied than just a single species. All right, so it's about time for a lecture break. And we're going to take our lecture break dealing with this same issue and this same question and coming back basically to the same exact question. What does it mean to be human? And as you're discussing this with those around you, again, make sure you come up with a discussion leader and your discussion leader comes up with somebody that's going to represent your group's ideas to the class as a whole. I want you to focus specifically on should it, should it bother us to think that the humankind is more than a single species. Okay? So again, going back to that original question, what does it mean to be human? And as you have that discussion, focus on should it bother us to think that the humankind is more than a single species? All right? Go ahead and take two and a half minutes. And I know I told you last time I didn't like half minutes, but we, we need it. So... So there are two. One is, what does it mean to be human? And as you focus on that, should it bother us to think that the humankind is more than a single species? Okay. Go ahead and take two and a half minutes. I'll give you that half minute to cluster, pick a group leader, discussion leader, get somebody that's going to represent your group's ideas to the class as a whole, and then two minutes to actually work through this. Two and a half minutes starting now. I'm just going to be our front row group again. Oh, oh man. Okay. Fun times. Fun times. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But I actually have to leave too. So, yeah. All right. Um, so, what do you guys think? I think. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll start. Um, my first thought was that. I don't think we should be because um, species are just a way to classify like the differences between us, but it doesn't necessarily 
just like saying like you've got blonde hair and I've got brown hair. Yeah. Like it's a way to just classify yeah. the difference. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. what does it mean? Um, yeah, what about you, Noah? Question? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. So, what does it mean? Same thing, I think. Kind of like what we do like all the time. Yeah. I feel like we're saying that's like, I guess so, because I feel like you get an established from one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, we find speciation in other in other groups and stuff like that. Why why isn't it possible to assume that there could be speciation among? Yeah. 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 What do you got, Kenny? I have nothing to Okay. Yes. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, does anybody volunteer to uh, present? Rachel? Okay. Like the main separation was at the Tower of Babel. That's when everybody kind of got split up and went off to their own separate areas. Which that was that could have been a major species. Yeah, we'll do that. All right. So wrap up your thoughts. If you, if you don't have a uh, yeah. a representative, get one. Yeah. Yeah. I just wish I could like, watch it. Yeah. Like, that kind of shit. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, All right. You need more time. Real quick. Do other groups need more time? Okay. You can have another minute. One more minute. For, for humankind, are we including Australopithecus and the home and the homo and stuff like that into humankind? Uh, maybe Sediba. Sediba, okay. Yeah, maybe Sediba. Got it, but not like Australopithecus. 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 Well, they don't even include it on here. Sediba is a more so recent discovery stuff, like than a lot of the species like inside of Australopithecus. That they are like, oh, that was and, the, that was the um, yeah, it's it's still up for debate bridge, as far as which genus it ought to. And so, Australopithecus. That's not. That's not. Like, I don't think that's part of like humankind. When you get into Homo. Then you get into more like human kind because we're homo sapiens. But Australopithecus is just they they classify them as um, hominids, so like upright walkers and stuff like that. People and or things that moved around. Um, but they weren't human kind yet. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's pretty. It's really confusing. So my chart that I All righty. Okay. All right, so we're going to start with this group in the back. Okay. 
Uh-huh. Now, what's interesting is we're the only living representative of this genus. So that, that question is somewhat easy to answer now, a little bit more difficult to answer at a time in which there are multiple species uh, within our genus. Okay. All right. Over here. Okay. Okay. All right. Right up here. Okay. Yeah, we disagree. To be honest. Okay, um, that's fine. I, I personally don't think it's. I, I don't think it should concern us because I think, um, again, like obviously based on, like what you're mentioning, the species doesn't necessarily mean reproductively isolated, just like you have like sure. sort of the Neanderthal genes. Yep. I think, um, uh, I lost my train of thought, but yeah, so I think, like, obviously, like, and I was just an example, like, between me and, like, a person who has an Asian heritage, there's going to be genetic differences and structural differences in our, in our skull, in our body sure. structure, and that's not, an, and I'm not going to stand up and say that I'm not made in the image of God or they're not made in the image of God, sure. just because we're different genetically, and if we're going to define genetics as structural differences, you could almost say we're different species. Right. So... I wouldn't say that it's wrong to stand up and say God can't create multiple species of humans because, again, if we're going to use the definition of species as not reproductively isolated but different structures, right. then not everyone who's alive right now is made in the image of God. Okay, sure. Yeah, that, the whole image of God idea is a very interesting concept. There's been a great deal of debate historically among theologians of, you know, Jewish theologians, Christian theologians, of how much of that actually plays into the way we look, right? I mean, once Christ becomes man, then obviously one person of the, and you could argue Christ was man for, you know, eternally, eternally man, right? He was man even before he came. But anyways, once the incarnation happens and then for the rest of eternity, one person of the Godhead looks like us, right? But then the question is, were we designed, does the image of God mean that we were designed to look like God? Or is the image of God more complex than that? and deal more with our authority and our relational abilities and some of that. Because if it has to do with looks, you run into some very interesting issues of who actually has the image of God more, me or you, right? Or me or Chad, right? Or me or Joey. And I hope it's one of you guys rather than me, right? Bearing more of the image of God. You also run into questions of why does our appearance not change during our sanctification, other than we get old, right? Because the image of God should be more and more obvious and more and more noticeable as we move through our process of sanctification, becoming more like Christ and therefore more like God. But our appearance, other than getting older, right, and losing our hair and getting fat and, you know, getting gray, right, our appearance doesn't change all that much. So now you've got some really interesting things if the image of God has a lot to do with the way we actually look. You also have to keep in mind, I mentioned this a couple of times, that the amount of variation in at, within our species in various structures is not significantly different than the amount of variation among all species of our genus. Now, you could argue, well, that's because we have a lot more representatives of our species than we do any others. You can make that argument, but just to know that the, the amount of variation is not significantly different. Yeah, Jake, and then we've got two more groups. So just start out there. Is it possible that the original image of God that was said in the Bible for a human to have is um, to be like, to have two arms, two legs, like ears, that stuff, but be allowed to have the variation so that everyone is different? Well, I mean, you see this with basically in almost all of the created kinds that we study really well, where we have a lot of evidence that we can, you know, take multiple species and root them back to a single ancestor where there is a, a pretty significant amount of variation within that group, right? And it doesn't seem to make us uncomfortable, well, most of us, like you're like, okay, all cat species, yeah, we'll root that back to original cat. But then once you start talking about humans, people start getting uncomfortable. Like really regardless of what your view of origins is. I'll tell you, E.O. Wilson uh, is one of the most famous evolutionary uh, ecologists of all time. He's a behavioral ecologist. 
and his like magnum opus, his 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 life's work, um, is is one of the greatest treatments of behavioral ecology ever done, and everybody's like, oh, cool, this is great, all these wonderful examples. The last couple of chapters have to do with behavioral ecology in humans, and lots of people start having issues with it, regardless of their view of origins. Like, no, I don't like that you're going to say you could predict human behavior based on their genetics. I don't like that. So now we've got an issue here. So once you start dealing with humans, things get a little bit more uncomfortable, right? And there's something real about that, and I think there's something important about that. Yeah, what do we have here? Um. Uh-huh. Um, but we aren't necessarily uncomfortable with it. We thought it was fine because we were talking about how um, all all people have descended from Adam and then through Noah. Uh -huh. He had three sons who, and then he spread out through the earth. And uh -huh. so it makes a lot of sense that there would be variation to that degree. And sure. So we were just talking about how like it, it, it might be odd to think about it that way, but it, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, there's certainly some initial discomfort, right? Not getting around that, but that's not the question, right? Uh, the, the question is, if you've had some time to think about it, then, and I guess maybe I should have clarified, but yeah, I mean, on the, on the forefront, you're like, well, that's kind of weird. I don't like this. Let's talk about something else, right? <laughs> All right, what do we have up here? Some ideas? Um, so overall, we said that it shouldn't bother us because um, species, like, even though it is a tether word, it's just a way to um, define the differences in characteristics. Okay. Like, like we mentioned one time that fruit flies have thousands of Sure. Species, but they're also fruit flies. Right. Um, well, and we have lots and lots, and so a lot of those species can and will interbreed if mm -hmm. you allow them, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have lots of examples of this. Mm -hmm. And so then there's the question of like, okay, well, where do we draw? Where do we draw that line? Is it if they can't breed, or if they don't breed, or if they usually don't breed, or if they only breed under these situations, right? You take a, a lion and a tiger, and you better believe you you can get them to breed. Although it doesn't happen naturally, you have to do artificial insemination because they'll kill each other. But they'll oftentimes kill members of their own species as well. So it's, you know, you could argue that with what you want. But you can actually form viable offspring. And some of them, although rarely, are actually um, not, are not sterile, are fertile, and they can reproduce themselves. Ligers and tigons, depending on which one's the father. And you could do this with horses and donkeys and horses and zebras, right? You can get a zorse or a Hebron, again, depending on who's the father. Um, so yeah, you, you've got some interesting things about of like, where do we draw that line? Like if they don't reproduce, or if they can't, or if they can, but only under certain characteristics, you have to realize species is not a biblical concept, right? Species is not a biblical concept. Species is a man-made way of describing the diversity of life. It is not a biblical concept, meaning that you could make the argument that separating a single kind into various species is meaningless. And people are actually making that argument from wildly different views of origins that the whole idea of species is meaningless. And you've got that coming up from all sorts of different areas, especially in ecologists. A lot of ecologists from an evolutionary background, evolutionary mindset, are making that very argument that the idea of breaking organisms into separate species is meaningless because we just don't have a great way to do it, so we have to deal with something else. And they would say we, you ought to think about it as evolutionarily significant units. And we'll come back to that when we talk about ecology in the very end. And so kind of thinking under that, that framework, this is basically what we're talking about, okay? So you would have the humankind, and then from here you can mark where it's split into groups that we've defined as separate species. Now, a branch that makes it all the way to the top indicates one that is currently living. We would call this an extant species, the opposite of extinct. And so this would be our species, and then you have a number of forms that have been described species that are now extinct. And then notice the, the way we're looking at this is as what's called an orchard. So rather than having a single tree of life, you have multiple trees representing your original kind that then diversified into different groups. So you can talk about what do you mean by species, but again, I want to reiterate, species is not a biblical concept. Mm -hmm. It is a man-made way of describing variation, right? So could you argue that all of these should be considered a single species? Absolutely you can, and some do, 
Now, what's interesting is there's still some value in being able to note like unique features and shared features and to put them in a different category. But then the question is, is there value in putting that at the level of species or maybe are we dealing with some kind of a lower category? Yeah. Um, just real quick, as a quick mention, kind of related to this is, I think I, I would have a very definitive definition of what makes a human a human. Okay. And, and it encompasses all the, all the different variations of it. Basically, a human is somebody who's descended from Adam. Yes. Okay, I like that. Over and I think that it would stop there and end there. And In terms of biologically, describing what, what it biologically means to be human. Exactly. So yeah. that, we have that, or that tree of humankind. Uh -huh. The base is Adam. And anything yep. that comes up above that would be a human being no, my, no matter what the... the no matter whether we put it in one category or another, exactly. right? Yeah. yeah, I mean... And that would define probably the genus homo as anything, is anybody descended from Adam. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you can deal with it that way. Again, you need to keep in mind that this idea of species is not a biblical con concept, okay? And so it, it, and, and it, it probably will make you uncomfortable to think that, that humankind can be represented by multiple species, but just keep in mind all we're doing is classifying different individuals based on shared features, right? And we're left with only those that are no longer alive. So we don't have living individuals except for the Neanderthal genome inside of us, right? So I guess we have arguably living Neanderthals. And some people get much higher than 7%, 7% on average. But I've heard of people getting up upwards of close to 20%. And now at 20%, you're like, man, I mean, what do we even do with that? Like, should we still classify them as homo sapiens or should we put them into their own category? And see, it's kind of like this whole really interesting discussion of separating them into separate so is species. There a specific ethnic group that has more Neanderthal than Europeans have more Neanderthal than any other ethnic group. So people of European descent, mostly Western European descent, have highest levels of Neanderthal DNA in the genome. Yeah. All right. So here are a couple of uh, examples. Here's uh, Lucy, or a recreation of Lucy's skull. Australopithecus afarensis, very clearly distinct from members of our genus. Here's a uh, skull of Homo sapiens. Here's a uh, representation of all of the skeletal elements we have of Australopithecus afarensis. And again, keep in mind that I mentioned this already, you're dealing with, in some cases, a single specimen of an entire species. And you're like, whoa, I mean, obviously things can be really interesting if you're only dealing with a single individual. Because I'll tell you what, like when you compare me to some other people structurally, you're like, thank God we all don't look like Dr. Ingle looks because then we'd have kind of some very interesting life stories, right? <laughs> and so it's like if you're just dealing with a single individual, you can get some really strange things, yeah. So for Australopithecus afarensis, would a lot of the... Um, it's Homo erectus. Homo erectus. Yeah. Oh, uh, for... Would a lot of would a lot of the secularists not classify that then as a human or a modern human? Would, it, would they classify that as something? Well, there's something debate. Else? Yeah, there's okay. a great deal of debate. You mean, like, so all members of that genus, mm -hmm. Australopithecus, or just Sediba? Because uh, Sediba, a lot of times, yeah. groups with... We could do all, all of Australopithecus. Um, so I think most people would consider it to be well within um, hominidae, our family, okay. moving towards our modern species. Okay. So much closer related to us than chimpanzees are, okay. sharing a much, mm -hmm. much closer recent ancestor. Mm -hmm. um, now, and then when you get into other members of our species, like uh, Homo neanderthalensis, I forget where they think that split was. Mm -hmm between the ancestor between us and Neanderthals, but it's like hundreds of thousands of years versus millions of years. Yeah. The idea, I think, is that uh, chimpanzees and us split mm -hmm. about uh, between 11 and 12 million years ago. And so, whereas with Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, yeah. it's in the hundreds of okay. thousands of years. So if Not we have a Neanderthal uh, DNA and stuff like that, like for the creationist timeline, where would that where would that be where we were able to 
like yeah i think what you would what you would find out is so you're you know you basically at the flood if if mm-hmm. what the bible describes as a global flood is actually a global flood which yeah. i think are, there's a lot of reasons to think that and we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks mm-hmm. um what you would have is a single family represented on that yeah and that on that ark and you would hope just for the sake of family relations that they looked like family, right? Mm-hmm. That, you know, you didn't have the children looking wildly different than the adult, because that'd be strange, right? Be a, a little weird. Um, and then, so what you would then have to deal with is uh, most of these hominids mm-hmm. are very clearly post flood yeah. deposits. And so you'd be looking at different species that were generated after the global flood. Okay. Um, and there are a lot of ways in which we can explain this. Mm-hmm. And an interesting one is not not the morphological differences. The interesting one is is the apparent differences in the complexity of their societies. Mm. That's where it gets a lot more interesting. Morphological differences, we can explain that. I'll tell you what. My, like the, 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 the foster kids that we have now don't look anything like my kids, which makes sense because they're not my kids, right? They're not genetically my kids. Um, that's a little bit easier to explain than wildly different uh, societies and seeming level of complexity of their societies. Because then you have a question, well, why did Homo erectus seem to struggle to have really well-developed, solid, you know, sophisticated societies, whereas our species, even mm-hmm. early representative of our species, have more complex yeah. evidence of more complex society. That one's a more difficult one to deal with. But if you want to have that conversation, we can. Or you can just get yourself a copy of what happened in the garden, read a couple of chapters written by Dr. Wood and Dr. Francis. So, all right. Um, so chapter 19, talking about microevolution. Several questions here. Uh, we're, there's no way we're going to get to the first three. On Canvas, you have slides that cover the first three. We're going to do our best to get through the first one. So what is genetic structuring? Following that, how does the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium work at maintaining genetic structuring? And then when do populations not stay at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? All right, this first question, what is genetic structuring? First of all, we need to talk about a population. So a population is all individuals uh, of basically of the same species living in the same place at the same time. So I didn't mention of the same species in there. Uh, it wasn't because I just told you that species is not a biblical concept, so I'm going to stop using it. I just I didn't include that in the description. So it's a collection of all the individuals of the same species living in the same place at the same time. That same time is an important part to carry on. It seems obvious. You're like, well, obviously, if you know the individual is there, but referencing time is very important when you're talking about populations so we have what's called the modern synthesis and this is a combination of darwinian and uh wallisian i don't even know how to make that into a, an adjective uh but thinking from from darwin and wallace on natural selection and evolution by natural selection along with um genetics and how the inheritance works from mendel And it's basically a synthesis of these ideas, and it's called the modern synthesis. And it basically couples ideas of descent with modification with ideas of how inheritance works. There wasn't a lot of buy-in originally for Darwin's ideas and Wallace's ideas. They both basically published their ideas on on descent with modification, natural selection at pretty much the same time. There wasn't a lot of buy-in because they didn't understand inheritance very well, and there wasn't a clear idea of how it could actually work. But once we understood inheritance and combine that, we, we get how it works. And this is basically the idea. So various characters, such as eye color, and this is a horrible one to use in, as, as an example because there are at least 16 genes that contribute to human eye color. But anyways, this is one I used. So characters such as eye color come in different traits, such as blue and green and various shades of those, hazel, brown, gray, white, you know, all kinds of different uh, varieties. So those are the different traits of a particular character. All right. Now, some characters are very simple to model because they're controlled by a single gene. Okay, so some characters are controlled by a single gene. Sort of like blood type. And the textbook talks a lot about blood type. Blood type's a little bit more complex, but much simpler than eye color. So some characters are controlled by a single gene, and then each trait is a different form of that gene, what we would call an allele. Yeah. 
the differences in blood type. Um, so blood type is one that the difference from one blood type to another is in what sugar is expressed on the surface of the red blood cell. And there's really only three options with regards to the A, B, and O. There's you express A sugar, you express B sugar, or you express no sugar, and then you have an O blood type. And so there's really only three forms, um, but all you need really is to only have two versions of that. And if you're going to represent that in eight individuals, that's, that's very easy to do. You, know, you could very easily have two different alleles represented in the eight individuals that boarded the arc and then gave rise to all of humans. Just really, you just need the A sugar and the B sugar, and then the ability to not deposit any, but that's easy to account for. So yeah. for Adam and Eve, then, on that, would one of them had to have been like A, B, and then the other O? Um, not necessarily. Not Nobody had to be no. O. Oh, okay. Just somebody had to have some A sugar and somebody had to have B. But both okay. individuals could have been able to express both. Right. And I think it's probably more likely that they were both A, B. Okay. That they both express both sugars on the red blood cells. And then from there, you've got different varieties, which mm. is easy to account for. All right. So we can measure the frequencies of each of these alleles, which, again, an allele is a single version of a gene. And so oftentimes when we're referencing alleles, we're talking about a very simple character that's determined by a single gene. So we can measure the frequencies of each uh, allele in the total collection. This total collection we call it the gene pool. So the gene pool collection of all alleles present uh, in your population. Now genetic structuring, so finally to answer the question of what is genetic structuring, it's representing uh, how these frequencies are, contribute to what's called the genotype frequency, which is the genetic makeup of an, of an organism. So we've mentioned this many times in this class, and I know we haven't talked about a great deal of, of DNA and how it works, but many times I've mentioned that we are diploid. And a lot of animals are diploid, right? We talked about plants that have alternation of generations. You've got the sporophyte, which is diploid, the gametophyte, which is haploid. But we are diploid, meaning we have two entire copies of our genome in all of our cells except our germ cells, those that are going to give rise to sperm if you're male or ova if you're a female. Okay, other than that, all of your cells have two copies of the genome, one from your mother, one from your father. So your genotype would represent not the way, not what you're expressing, so if you're going with blood type and you have type A blood, type A blood, that would be your phenotype, your physical appearance. Your genotype would represent what actual alleles do you have. Okay? So the genetic structuring represents the frequencies of genotypes uh, in the population. So if you wanted to do genetic structuring of blood type in humans, it would be what percentage of individuals have type A blood with you know, an A and an O. What percentage of individuals have A type blood with two A's? What percentage of individuals have type B blood with two B's versus one B and one O? So it's not just the, the phenotype, what you actually see, but it's the genotype, the genetic makeup. All right, so here in our simplest representations, which is what we're going to rely on for this class, because anything more complicated than this will allow a computer to do it and then just interpret and analyze the results. But in our simplest illustration, we have two alleles, one of which we call P, the other of which we call Q. Okay, so if you only have two alleles, if you add up the frequencies of each, these are the frequencies, they better equal one, right? Because one is 100% and represents your whole population, your whole gene pool. Okay. So let's assume just for a minute, okay? This is, again, this is assumption, this is not reality. Okay, let's assume for a minute that there were only two alleles for human eye color. Okay, that there were only two alleles for human eye color and you had brown and blue. And then everything else was just basically a combination of those. Okay, that's not the way it actually works, but just for simplicity. And then we can figure out, okay, well, what percentage of the total alleles of the gene pool is made up by the brown and what percentage is made up of the blue? Okay. And this is how we would typically represent that. Now on to the genetic structure. This is not genetic structure. This is just allele frequencies. If you want to get to genetic structuring, you have to get to genotype frequencies. Okay. What do you notice about these individuals? Man, it capitalized it again. It's terrible. I made it lowercase, went back and made it lowercase, and it turned it back to capital when I wasn't looking. It's embarrassing. I'm sorry. 
So this individual has two p's. So we call this individual p squared. Okay. This individual has two p's. This individual has one p and one q. This individual has two q's. Okay. Now we can tell we're representing the genotypes because human individuals are diploid, meaning they have two combinations or two entire collections of the genome. And so there'd basically be three options if there are only two alleles. You could have two of the p allele, you could have two of the q allele, or you could have one of each. Those are your options. Okay. And again, we're only using the simplest models because anything more complex than this will let a computer do it, and we'll just interpret the results. Now, what's nice is these represent specific individuals. So we tend to use p to represent the dominant allele, the one that is expressed over the other. So that's why eye color is a nice, even though it doesn't work this way, it's a nice illustration because if you express, if you have brown eyes, you could still have the ability to make blue eyes. It's just overwhelmed by your ability to make brown eyes because eye color is just the amount of pigment that you deposit into your iris. Anyways, so even though it's not simple like this, it's, it's a good illustration of it. Okay, so this tends to be the dominant, the one expressed over the other. So this tends to be the recessive, the one expressed only if the other isn't there, okay? So both these individuals here would express the dominant character, okay? So again, if this was eye color, this is brown, this is blue, both these types of individuals would have brown eyes. This are the only individuals that would actually have blue eyes. They actually have two copies of the allele that is only expressed in the absence of the other. Does that make sense? Okay, these are still frequencies, so it's like what percentage of the population is what we would call homozygous dominant, and we'll come back to all these terms again next week. What percentage is heterozygous? What percentage is homozygous recessive? And this also has to add up to be one Y. Yeah, it has to be 100%. We only have three options, right? You either have two of the one allele, you have two of the other, or you have one of each. Those are your only three options. There are no other options for how your genetics can be composed. And so these frequencies need to also add up to 1% or 100%. And so this is the genetic structure, figuring out how many of your individuals have two copies of P or what percentage of your individuals have two copies of P, what percentage of your individuals have a copy of each, and what percentage of your individuals have two copies of Q. And then I'll leave you with this, some of the genetic variation within a single species, right? This is within a single litter. And this is what happens when you allow your cat, your cat that's a mutt to breed with another cat that's a mutt. You usually get all sorts of different forms and colors and temperaments and psychoses and all sorts of wonderful things that tend to go along with Felis catus, our domesticated cat.